Everyone right now is finishing up their projects. Um, they're spot checking, spot, spot checking each other's wire hookups and uh, making sure that all their connections are good in their firefly costume. I'm gonna go get one of the guys who give me admin privileges and install our Arduino on the main presentation computer. Oh, I'll be right back. I think I did something wrong, and I'm just like, oh, I should do this. Chapter 5.
two sets are getting married. Eric, you didn't have any brains, right? No. Here's two brains for you. Everybody has two brains now, correct? Yeah. No. Uh, They are, in fact. People have been reading their assignment. Very good. Hey, hey. I don't have any voice. I wish I had a So, I'm going to, from my mouthpiece. Yeah, you put my three. Perfect. I don't know what you're doing, but your mouthpiece, I'm going to do I cut this, my mouth wire in half, and then I have them only make a connection when my mouthpiece is closed. So, that makes sense, right? Yeah. I'm going to execute. Execute it. Go for it. I believe in you. Are you kind of so supportive of me? It's embarrassing. Fine, you're going to fail. There we go. George said. So, everyone, just, um, I'm going to talk, keep doing your work and talking to each other. I'm just going to discuss some logistics with you while you're doing that. Um, Thursday, where are we meeting? TSRB. Yeah, Tech Square. TSRB, just meet right in the lobby where the lady, you know, checks your ID and stuff right like that. Upstairs. Just down, oh, as soon yeah. as you just, you just walk in, you're going to see me standing there being like, hey, meet up. Um, so we're going to meet up there. I'm going to bring you guys down to the rapid prototyping room. Um, I'm going to show you guys the different tools um, that you can gain access to, such as the, there's a 3D printer. There's is there a 3D printer there? No, yeah. Because the only one I've been using is over in the Invention Studio. And that one's always being used. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This one is not being used as much. So, yeah, you can get access to it. It's cool. Um, and you guys should be able to get access to it after I kind of teach you the safety protocols of everything. <laughs> um, the main thing that I'll be showing you guys how to use that day is probably the laser cutter. Uh, the laser cutter is super awesome. It's like the best tool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, and it's very easy to use too. So I'll be showing you guys how to do that. We'll discuss um, your results of your guys' research and your fireflies, because you should all have turned that in by when? You guys tomorrow. Know tomorrow midnight. Tomorrow midnight. Tomorrow midnight, yes, exactly. So tomorrow at midnight, all your like official stuff is due into T-Square, which is basically like your little bit of documentation. Yes. And your uh, code, plug in. Oh, man, you're so pretty. Hey. <laughs> How's your things to plan? Oh, okay. I can't play with my weapons dog because her job can meet up Thursday night at like, let's say, 9 p.m. I'll be here. Yeah, I have a thing from 8 to 11, but I can. Are you having time this Friday, which is totally the reason why I'm free from this because I'm playing on studying things for a night? It won't take that long. We'll just run around for maybe like an hour, play some modified hide and go seek and lightning bugs. Um, but it looks like we have a good majority of people that can make it. So let's say Thursday night, 9 p.m., um, we'll meet out in front of the CRC in that kind of quad area there and uh, that's where we'll rendezvous and if I figure out a darker place that's nearby on campus that we can meet then we'll meet over there uh, but uh, yeah so that sounds good uh, make it if you can uh, don't uh, you know blow off your other classes uh, if you can't make it or something like that uh, but you were it'd be super great the more people we get out there I'll even see if I have other friends who can wear some of the other costumes. We're going to have all kinds of uh, virtual fireflies out there. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So we have, that is next week. And that's this week, right? Oh, no, that's, that's this week. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, but now I need to talk about next week because am I going to be here next week? No. Yeah. No. I'm going to be at a ubiquitous computing conference in Zurich. Uh, and so I will be gone the entire week. You guys will have open lab on Tuesday, uh, so you can meet up here and work with each other. 
your main goal for next week is going to be brainstorming ideas for project two, which will be your first uh, homemade cybiotic interface. Uh, project two is going to be, and we'll discuss this more on Thursday, it's going to be basically make your own system that takes in one input and has one output that interacts with a living creature, okay? <laughs> and uh, so Tuesday is just going to be an open lab. Thursday, I'm probably going to have a guest um, lecturer, Paul Clifton, my buddy, is going to come in. And he's going to teach you guys how to send basically serial commands so you can get your um, Arduinos and your AT Tinies to talk to computers or to other Arduinos and AT Tinies. Okay? Sound good? Um, that piece looking good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, weird. Okay, cool. I think that is most of uh, those things. Now, uh, what time? Uh, uh, 12, 12 30. Okay. Can we have everybody group up really quick right now? Uh, just kind of grab some chairs around here. And I want you guys to whip out your journals and let's talk about your bio performance. Okay. So a little circly powwow. And so now that we're taking a little soldering break, if you have a soldering iron that's on, just turn it off. Uh, cool. Okay. Cool looking journal. I think I have a photo. I don't use it in my box. So, can I push your like, shit over? Is it other people? <laughs> <laughs> nice, thank you. <laughs> um, cool, yeah, everyone. Eric knows all your photos. Um, it's getting closer. Show your, just kind of wave it around. Oh, nice, nice, it's beautiful. It's called if you give an ant a cookie. Okay, cool. So, so what'd you do? I was at the lake and I was eating cookies and I didn't want them anymore. So I threw them down and I was going to throw them in the water afterwards. But I looked down and there were ants all over it. So I just like observed them and then tried to like mess up their pattern and like stack it on like driftwood to see how high they would go. Like Would you stack the cookie on driftwood? Yeah, and I just like put other stuff under and stuff. And then I tried to like see where the were going and stuff. And I think they like the white sugar cookies better than the red sugar cookies. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Any wild hypotheses why this would be so? Uh, maybe they don't like red down. Maybe? Cool. So, and then just like thinking about how they talk to each other. And I was really glad because I was wearing sandals and they didn't crawl on my sandals at all. Yeah. And so they just went through the cookies without being happy. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. Were there anything <laughs> about your physical performance that you found that were unexpected? Um, was there anything that came up while you were you know, stacking cookies or something that you were like, oh man, I didn't realize that the structural integrity of red sugar cookies is different than white sugar cookies or something, uh, anything like that. No, not really, but after we were done, I like crumbled up the cookie to help them, so that they wouldn't have to have them themselves. But, yeah, well, uh, can you tell me why? So you think that it's, uh, so in the course of this, you kind of developed your own theory that it's easier for them to eat a bunch of crumbles um, versus a solid block of a cookie. Yeah, I think so. But some of them just stayed on the cookie. Hmm. They just other ones would like do work, but they look kind of dead. But I know they probably weren't dead. 
because I would like shake it every once in a while. Oh. Well, so, um, so you're asking, like, why would they just be standing there? Yeah, they're just chilling. So there's, there's a lot of different things um, about ants. There could be a behavior that's evolved to maybe, um, maybe only some of them forage, and others, once they get to a food zone, they are there to kind of guard the food zone and, you know, make sure if another predator comes that they can kind of defend it. Um, there's also things always, especially with creatures like ants, where there's a lot of inefficiency in nature. Uh, things that evolve, they don't evolve to be perfectly optimal systems. They evolve because that's just what happened, and that's what kept happening, and it kind of worked. So there's all these like hacks. Nature just has like all these hacks, or there's all this like superfluous stuff that just happens that will never go away. For instance, like if you have a bunch of ants. And let's say they have this behavior where every 10 seconds, all the ants spin around in circles three times. Uh, but then they just keep going their normal business. Um, if this behavior doesn't significantly impact you know, how they're um, able to reproduce and procreate and stuff like that, it might just stay with them forever. Um, and people will be like, why do they spin around? And people could develop all these theories about like, well, they spin because it's the northern hemisphere and they use it. Um, so, I mean, you, uh, that could be some sort of possibility of why. There's also the fact that maybe they're, they're just chilling and, you know, yeah. the ants are just being kind of dumb. <laughs> yeah, I also like spun the driftwood around to see if they would like realize they were going in the wrong direction. And one ant was having some trouble, but they didn't. Huh. Yeah. Cool. All right, Danielle. Um, so I targeted squirrels, and because squirrels all, are all over, I thought they would be easy to manipulate, and it's like, they're all over the place, so I just wanted to contact them easily, um, and that, like, I could get close to them with food, so I decided I would, like, try to do some sort of thing where I would lead them around with peanut butter wine. So I turned around peanut butter, and I slathered it onto a branch, um, but actually, so my script was to try to do something with that. But actually just approaching the, the squirrel was really, really difficult. And I couldn't find many squirrels on Monday. So um, a lot of what I ended up doing was like, for, for like 10 minutes, I decided to just like leave a branch by a tree and be like, okay, hey, will, will a squirrel come by? Um, no squirrels came. So I decided to go for a walk, and I saw a squirrel, and they started like chasing him because of my little peanut butter wand. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he went up the first tree, and then I was like freaking out. I was like, what do I do? So I threw the peanut butter wand onto the grass, and I was like, maybe he'll go for it. But then at the end of going to a second tree, he, he went back on the ground and ignored the peanut butter wand, and he went up a second tree. And then I was like, okay, can't let this go. So. Um, on like the lowest fork of the tree of the branch, I wedged the peanut butter wand in the peanut butter section onto that part. So if he had to go down the trunk, he would have to cross the peanut butter. Um, <laughs> and for like seven minutes, he just like hung out on that tree, like did his squirrel stuff. But then he eventually went for the peanut butter. And I mean, that was cool. He, he, liked it, he nibbled at it, but then um, it was really unfortunate because like two minutes into that, um, a car came by and recognized me, so then they like waved and yelled at me, and then I had to like, I was obligated to like have a conversation with them, and like it was like a really tragic, like I have a recording of like when I turned back to the tree and the squirrels like on the road running away, <laughs> and I was like, oh, so he left. Um, I guess like while while like he was like nibbling at it and he stopped nibbling and he went back up there, I like tried to take some peanut butter and like put some more on like on more branches and things like that because I was like very unprepared. I looked around and I couldn't find more long sticks, so then I wanted to like give him more peanut butter, but the best I could do was just go up there and literally like, try to get some peanut You learned all kinds of things about uh, your theoretical actions versus. Actually, <laughs> actually implemented in the wild. Yeah. Uh, cool. And I like your um, your depiction of how the your little schematic of how <laughs> the squirrel moves around and how well she labeled different time periods uh, of things that happened during her thing. 
and even just nice little sketches. Um, it's always just to just draw animals. And it just helps you reflect on them and then think about, you know, like how they work and different stuff like that. Totally. I, I just kind of avoided drawing in this one. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. I draw. I can't draw. <laughs> yeah, no, drawings are great. Drawings, make maps, uh, draw schematics, diagrams, charts, tables, gather statistics about things, maybe. Um, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, cool. Uh, anybody have, okay, quick. 10 second design challenge. Can anyone think of something you could simply program to uh, participate in her performance with some sort of squirrel? Let's say trying to get a squirrel to. Okay, okay how, would you, how would your peanut butter slider machine work? just like walking past or running, but if you give it like definitely like attention, like squirrel does. So. Yeah. yeah. So that was really weird. I think um can I share another weird observation that I Sure. Have? One more. Okay. Um so the tree was kind of over like the branch that was on was kind of over a car and I kept thinking I was like, is he trying to run away? And I was like, could squirrels even like go on top of cars because I've never seen a squirrel on top of a car. So then if I were to do another experiment, it would be um, not about peanut butter, but about what kind of material can, like, are squirrels comfortable with landing on? Like, is it an actual texture thing, like car metal? Or if I, like, took a branch and spray painted it paint, like, would it go on that branch? Huh. Things like that. Especially if it was forced to be on that environment. Cool. Yeah, and there's lots of um, uh, things just about, you know, material concerns that also build into like these ideas of, you know, when Janet talks about scripting the interactor, um, the, when you're programming some sort of behavioral environment or um, interactive thing with it, um, there's certain things you almost, you know, embed into the materials you're using or the materials you're putting out in the environment uh, that can encourage or discourage specific behaviors. Yeah, great observation. Larry. I don't have any sketches. Uh, it's cool. My journal is kind of sparse. Sure, not, sure. That, uh, not that I didn't actually do anything. Wait it. Wait it up. Show you yeah. It's really simple. Um, pretty much what I did was I found a line of ants. And for the first like first phase, I just kind of sat there. And I just kind of, I had like a, a pine needle to play. I, I'm not a good fan of bugs. Ants aren't that aggressive towards, or they aren't that skittish, so they just kind of do their own thing. It's observing. So I just kind of put it in their way every now and then, just to see what they would do. And contrary to how I expected it to be, they actually didn't get all that angry. Hmm. I just kind of got in their way, and like, oh, what's this thing doing here? Uh, and then I moved out the way, and they're just like, oh, oh, okay. And I just, just keep going. And, and for like my performance, uh, I would just choose a random ant. And I would just like I put uh, the twig in the line, and when, whenever one of them would climb on it, I'd move them somewhere else and let them get off and see what they would do. And generally, every single ant, they just kind of it was kind of like they were just moving in the line because they would get on the on the twig, and then I would move and then they would they'd go around in a circle, and then I put it down and they just get off and keep going and look for their little trail and just kind of wander around the same area for a bit. And eventually, they just come back to the twig and just move back to the line and went about their business. Because they found the trail. Hmm. And I just kept doing that until my time was up. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. What are, um, if you had some sort of superpower to manipulate some other factor in the hands going across the line, 
like even if you could put the stick up and down incredibly fast or, or something. Can you? I would actually want to see that like make a machine where it was kind of like a. Well, actually, I can imagine what would happen if we just had a instead of like opening and closing the line kind of slow. If you just kind of had like a thing, you would probably they would probably just hand chopping machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you see the, um, did you guys see my project, uh, yeah, the like ant the, morse code yeah, thing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so that was similar. And you also had to deal with, like, how am I going to make this not just an ant chopping machine? <laughs> uh, that definitely happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's no way of avoiding it. One thing that's nice is, uh, out in the jungle, though, um, jungle ants are pretty robust. Um, like a lot of them, like you can't even crush them with your hand. Yeah. They're pretty big. Um, huh? So the other thing is the ground is really soft. Cause it's just like so it became more of like an ant squishing into the ground, and then like ah, ah. Um, so that yeah, that happened a good amount. <laughs> but you can also uh, you can also do things where. Let's say you had instead of your ant chopper with just a, a straight you know blade or a razor on the bottom or something like that, um, it could have some sort of thing that's soft and that kind of fans out so it pushes. If something's caught directly underneath it, it will push as it goes down and you know gets them onto one side or the other instead of just just crushing. <laughs> cool. Anyways, okay, so I had to go home this weekend, so I ended up... Where's home? Home in South Africa, Georgia. Okay. Okay, so like a suburban, kind of, I don't know. But, um, you can get out. Okay, she doesn't want to. Okay, so, um... Flash issue journal. Yeah, flash issue journal. Yeah, so, um, I sat in a big lot of parking lot and heard the bird. So, you know those little, like, chickadees? patterns which are more kind of instinctual where it's like um, you know Larry punches me in the face and I'm genetically programmed to punch back or something um, then there is um, more so things that uh, individuals uh, can learn kind of within their own lifetime um, I learned that every time uh, Larry has a, a 
hat on, um, that also means that he's packing two lunches. So maybe I'll try to like mooch lunch off of him uh, every time he's wearing a hat, but I'm not even going to try when he doesn't have a hat on. Um, some sort of you know thing that I learned, or I'm a bird, and I learned that uh, this girl keeps standing up and yelling at me uh, in a blue shirt, and so maybe I'm just not even going to bother if people in blue shirts jump up, jump up at me. Uh, but then there's also um, culturally passed on behaviors, um, and so this is where a thing learns not from uh, its genes telling it something to do or from some sort of action it has witnessed and observed and is trying to decipher some sort of pattern from. Uh, but this is actually behaviors that it sees members of its own kind uh, responding and they get passed down generationally instead of evolutionarily. So an example of this is uh, in um, South Africa in the early 1900s, there was this problem where these people, there were these elephants running around and they were like destroying everyone's farms. And they got this guy named Pretorius who was uh, this like hunter. And they were like, hey, we need you to kill all these elephants. And he's like, okay. So he goes out and just starts blasting elephants. And let's say there was about a thousand elephants running around this place. He's blasting them. They're just easy. He walks up to them and just blasts them. But as he keeps killing just hundreds and hundreds of these elephants, um, the elephants kind of start catching on. And they're just like, whoa, we got to be careful about humans. Um, they're trying to kill us. Um, every time I see a human, like three of my friends die. Um, and so all these elephants start acting more and more aggressive towards humans. And the other elephants see them acting aggressive towards humans and respond in the same. And eventually, there's only about 50 of these elephants left. And they actually kind of just, quarant they became super dangerous. They were just killing all sorts of people. And they actually kind of like quarantined them slash put them in like a nature preserve. Um, and uh, for decades, uh, even while the original elephants had like died and perished, these elephants still remain super aggressive towards any human-like contact, um, whereas the original elephants just come. <laughs> so that's an example of um, an interesting interface could be, so it's always good to think about, because uh, often we'll, we'll resort to kind of human time scales when we're thinking about our designs, and be like, oh, okay, um, the dog wiggles its collar, and then the LEDs turn on. Um, you know, okay, boom, that's something I as a human kind of understand. But you can also think of something in other sorts of time scales, either really quick, uh, you know, like with uh, fruit flies that only live for a day or two, um, or things that could last over several months or even years, um, like if you want to do a project with plants, uh, and you know, you slowly change its growth and behavior and something like that. Um, or if you wanted to do your project with these birds, you could set up some sort of installation outside the Mo's and kind of try to see if you can teach them to uh, be fearful of girls in blue shirts, uh, but not girls in orange shirts or something like that. Um, so that's, it's always good to think about different time scales. All right, cool. Um, you three, let's crank through it. Um, Show us your beautiful journal. So, not really that many sketches. What's the sketch that it's you have? Dog. Oh, it's a dog. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So I wanted to come up with something like an animal that's not kind of used to humans, but for some reason I was just really having trouble with getting all those animals to react. So I was like, fine, I'll go use a dog. So I used my friend's dog and my boyfriend's dog. Uh, and I just, Two different dogs? Two different okay. dogs. And I used a lot of different situations for both of these dogs. Ah. Uh, just to kind of see like what they would do. So I was basically just like playing with them because the dog kind of like used to who I am. Uh, so the dog would be comfortable with interacting with me. And both dogs knew tricks, which is important. Um, my friend's dog, she would, like, uh, I would tell her to, like, sit, and then you know, she'd kind of look at me like, what are you doing? I'd be like, sit. And you'd have to, like, do the hand motion, whatever it was. I don't know what it was. And then she'd do it, uh, but my boyfriend's dog wouldn't do it unless he had food. And then, in which case, she'd do, like, all the tricks at once. Like, she didn't know what she, what <laughs> trick he wanted her to do, but she knew that if she did a trick, like, even if you're, like, saying sit, she'd, like, start trying to shake with you, and you're like, no, sit, and she's like, shake and, and um, she'd start drooling and then 
uh, I brought my like, sister with me, and when my sister was with me and they like didn't know her, then they wouldn't do anything so I freaked out, especially my boyfriend's dog. She'd just sit there and she'd start drooling. She'd really scared. Um, and then I had just like their owners talk to them, and then the dog would listen. So it's kind of like, are they listening? Because like, my dog would listen to my dad. I think it's because he was like the alpha male of the house, so I didn't know, like, because both of the people's dogs were guys. I didn't know if it was like, their guys had like evil voices, the dog like listen. Sexist dogs. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, or if it was because like, that was their owner. So I don't really know what that was, but anywho, the dog listened to their owners a lot better than they listened to me. And they listened a whole lot better when there was food involved. Hmm. Um, and if there was like some stranger in the area, then they would just freak out and run away. So I didn't know like what it. I was kind of wondering what their motivation was behind behind doing what they were supposed to, and it was pretty much just getting something from hmm. from their owner. So you witnessed a lot of like kind of state dependent. Behaviors. Yeah, like what their like motivation, oh. like it's changing different variables in their environment, cool. and they're most comfortable with the. Familiar. It'd be interesting to see Hopefully. if you could take like, you know, the male owner's dog or something yeah. and have him do the same commands or something, but like put like a little voice modulator or something. <laughs> I tried squeaky. using a deep voice uh. and the dog's ears actually went like, like, like <laughs> what? And I was like, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> so I could try to use like a voice disguiser and see if like the higher pitched voice. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure it was like a lower pitched voice. Like whenever any like uh, guy would talk. Well, you can see if the guy uses a higher pitched voice, yeah, they if, ignore him. If they're like, what? Yeah, uh, I'll try that. <laughs> cool. Uh. Okay, so I was by Alpha Z Sorority House, and there's a lot of um, straight cats. So. Your journal. Oh my. Ben and White is a little bit. Nice. <laughs> and then. Um, and so I found it was a stray kitten, and it was under a uh, bush, and I found a branch that was going to be this long, with those leaves on the end. And so I sat maybe like two feet of the kitten, because you could like really see it in the bushes, it wasn't totally hiding. And at first I was like, going like that with the branch in the grass, and it was like, it was like getting scared. Except they're like backing away. And then I stopped and like stared at it for a little bit. And then I took the branch and I would like slowly slide it back and forth and that's when it was like intrigued, not when I was like aggressively shredding the mm. branch through the grass. So that, it never actually came out, but it would like, the other ears were and it was like, hmm. Like, but I feel like cats and dogs are like more intelligent animals, so I feel like maybe if I had done that same set of actions with another cat, it might have acted like Oh, okay. So that in that way, if you're doing some sort of interactive thing, maybe higher intelligent things are maybe more volatile yeah. in their behaviors that you have to do with. That's a cool, um, cool thing to think about. Awesome. Let's finish over there. Um, so I was also at the Leap of Cape. Um, and I was going to find some other stuff, but I ended up writing about Oh, uh, okay. Um, so what you, would you add and do to this? <laughs> and so, like, I, there were a lot of, like, different boats that I interacted with, like, on the boat and stuff. Um, but this one I just really wanted to observe. And see These bugs happened. were on the boat? The ants were? No, not the ants. Oh, okay. But there were some other bugs. Like, there were, like, the tenors and things like touching the things that they would do. Cool. Um, and there was a spider that was on a web, and then you, like, I touched the web and see what they do. like, shot back into the hole that it had in the window. It was really cool. Cool. Um, <laughs> but like these ants, like I just really wanted to like see what they were doing with the cookie. Um, and like the biggest thing for me was he wasn't like carrying the cookie. Like I just would always imagine my like, ants like lifting it up and like walking forward. He was pulling it backwards. Um, mm -hmm. And he was doing that like all of the pine straw and just all these different things. He was He's pulling the whole cookie or just a crumb? Like a large crumb. Huh. Like, really? Like the guy was looking at the small tiny black ants. So this big red ant came out of nowhere hmm. and like just started carrying a large chunks of this cookie away. Like you get on a cookie, like take a chunk and walk away with it. Um, Were the little ants messing with the big ants at all? So like he would take it over to this like piece of bark that was in the grass and he like started to crush it up. And then the little black ants came up and would take pieces and run away with them. Huh. It was very interesting. <laughs> cool. Um, I actually videoed some of it too. Show us the video real quick.
What did you film it with? Uh, does everybody here have some sort of um, utensil for capturing photos and videos? Yes. Yes? I have a better camera for pictures than for videos. Cool. So, like, I was just really amazed at his like, determination to go back. Uh huh. Maybe you thought it was easier to like pull it than to push it? Mm hmm. And he's just like, oh, no, there are all these obstacles that you can't see. If I were in it, I would not do it all. Yeah, I'd be like, I guess. <laughs> Give up. We don't need this. So one of your one of your aunt fun facts of the day is that so ants have an interesting mechanism to make sure that they come back to the nest. Uh, they it looks like they have big teeth, right? Yeah. Big mandibles. They're not actually teeth at all. They're just grippers. So all they can pretty much do, they can bite things for defense and, you know, like, you know, scare them off if you think hooks in you. Um, but uh, they are pretty much just for picking up things and carrying them around. They don't have, like, teeth. They can't chew. And so this keeps your ants from being like, screw the queen. I'm just going to, I'm eating this cookie myself. Um, instead, they'd be like, oh, this cookie looks so good. I have to bring it back to the nest to feed it to the larvae who have teeth, so the larvae get to eat it up first, and then kind of reverse baby bird, they puke it into the adults, um, and so then the adults finally get to eat from that. So it kind of, um, it, it, uh, this, this, this foraging behavior is actually embedded in the structure of how the ants operate, um, to kind of, you know, make sure that they have to come back. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a kind of protocol that's in place. Yeah. Do have American culture in retirement? Cool. Um, okay, great. We have a little bit more time left. Um, what we're going to do is now I'm going to teach you guys how to program the AT Tinies. Um, so if everyone busts out your brains and your AT Tiny programmers and grab a computer. And then also open the email that I sent out earlier. Yeah. And how is this? What to do to that goes on this chip 
that you can then add more programs to it. So this is your program, and then this is the bootloader. This bootloader makes it so that you can talk and it can be programmed just like a regular Arduino, like those big Arduinos that you guys have. So you can run your Blink programs or whatnot. Um, If you're a Mac, you don't need drivers. If you're a PC, you need to go to the SparkFun website and get the actual drivers. Master. 
Um, you need to go one folder down below that. You just copy this folder in there, restart your Arduino, and you'll be good. Perfect. Okay. Um, make it lower. Copy that entire AT tiny folder that you just downloaded and dump it in there. So for you, let me go for it. So I wasn't able to get it. Yeah, 8585 internal 8 megahertz block. 
So what you're going to do then, after you choose that, you choose programmer. Because we use a different thing to program these devices than your regular Arduino uses. So you choose programmer. And you should use USB Tiny ISP. Okay? Does everybody see that option? Okay. Yeah. Tools programmer. I mean, if you go to your Arduino um, program and you choose File, Preferences, it'll have something called a Sketch Folder, where it saves all of the normal sketches you make. Inside that folder, you're going to make a hardware folder, and you're going to load your stuff in there. Cool. So you have your thing going? Um, you have a little program? Nice. Cool. Uh, if you're if you're at the point where you have chosen the correct board, which is do you have the board listed yet, right? Did you dump the thing in the right folder? So now you're gonna copy that folder, the tiny kind of folder. You're gonna copy that whole folder over. So like this one? No, you no, you want just the AC tiny. And then hardware. Things. Um, if we just want to make an LED blink, 
we should look for an output pin. So I color coded some of the, uh, the pins into input and output. We should look for an output pin, and that refers to pins one or zero. The labels out here are what the Arduino refers to them as. So we can change that pin 13 to either zero or one, and it will make an output and make our LED blink on and off. Make sense? So, if we look at this um, thing, we want to just do a basic output, right? So we look over here and we go output. Okay, that's either this bottom right hand pin or the pin right above. So let's say we use the bottom right hand pin, which is actually over here. That's the top right. So that's that pin right there. So what we can do is instead of referring to it as pin 13, which is what that pin would be on your bigger Arduino, we are going to call pin 0, and that's the one we're going to be in my in my firefly i use both of those but you guys are using pin zero okay pin zero is basically going to be your button on your fireflies okay so um pin zero so change it to a zero you got it now run your program and upload it to it and see if it works. You don't really need to do it. The verify is just to check and make sure that your code has some errors in it, which is good. But then that actually sends your code over to your chip. And then we plug it into our thing and then Ooh. Well, first let's just see. 
you can get blinking on your thing. So you plug it in. Now, um, go up to tools and select burn bootloader. And just double check for me that your board was the correct board. Yep, perfect. So now, reload the sketch onto it. And hold on, before you even take it off, your LED programmer stick has a built-in LED on pin zero for you. So you can double check without even having to plug it in. Now it's blinking every second. See that? Perfect. And so that's how you can test to see that you're actually being able to program it, is you bring it over there, send it on, and then we'll see if it just blinks on and off every second. One, one, one. Perfect. So you're able to program it. So the program is working fine. So, what we Yes. That's going to be information that we can find. Sure. And that we just have to change. Exactly. So you're going to look up something on probably some sort of economic site or Google Scholar or something like that. Something along the terms of like Firefly flash patterns. Um, you're probably going to look, want to look for North American Firefly. Uh, those kind of things. You're going to want to try to do two different kinds. You want to, yeah. So <laughs> Huh? That's why you have two brains. You program in two different fireflies. Um, you'll probably end up finding things like little charts and diagrams that list uh, firefly flashing patterns. And you're going to convert those to series of delays. You're also going to need to make sure how your uh, firefly thing is triggered and the way that it gets triggered is by switch using a little mouthpiece trigger. Okay. Uh, yeah? Are you trying to click that up here? Uh, yeah. Where did you find it from? Uh, some guy, Blair, what was what, 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 Yeah, so exactly. You'll end up finding something like uh, these things where it's like half second between pulses and then three seconds or something like that. You're going to need to translate these into basically a series of delays. So you'll have something like uh, turn high, delay one second, turn off, delay four seconds, turn on, you know, that kind of thing. Depending on your research problem. Because then you'll notice that people, even in the scientific community, people have different opinions on like, how the fireflies flash or you know things like that. Yeah, exactly. They're gonna be a little different. There's really quick, really quick, really quick, um, before everyone goes, there's an integral part of this that's still missing, which is how to create the trigger to set off the firefly pattern, right? Because it, no, it shouldn't be going. It should only trigger the firefly flashing pattern when you bite down your mouthpiece. Otherwise, it should be completely off. Because the firefly's butts are just flashing all the time. They get eaten and destroyed all the time. But they only want to flash it when they think a lady. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, around probably 4 p.m. today, I'm going to send, I'm going to email you all out a very simple example code where I won't give you complete uh, details about how the exact fireflies work, but it'll show you how you can take an input from your pin uh, and use it to trigger a flashing pattern. Okay? Make sense? My office hours tomorrow are from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. over at my office at TSRB, third floor. So if you have problems, come talk to me then. It'll be totally free. Yes? Yeah.
you're going to have one that you say pin mode, LED, input, pull up. I'll talk about that in a second. Or, or when I send up the email. Um, but uh, so you'll, you'll set up another pin, and then you'll put in some logic that says, like, if this input is low, do X. If it's high, do a different X. Uh, why? <laughs> yeah. Uh, your sketch? Okay, Just sketch your sketch, save your sketch anywhere you want. Before Arduino, the Arduino, they pulled it over Arduino. Cool. And again, email me, questions, uh, everybody clean up, make sure the hot, 